So let me first uh, introduce George D. Montanez. He is a machine learning researcher and data scientist with Microsoft, working on automatic machine learning systems. He was recently awarded a PhD from Carnegie Mellon University in machine learning under Dr. Cosma Shalizzi, focusing on developing a framework for understanding why machine learning works from an abstract and uni unified uh, uh, search per perspective. Dr. Montanez received his MS degree in computer science from Baylor University and his BS degree from the University of California, Riverside in computer science. His research has been recognized with several awards. Now, this is, this is pretty impressive. Usually, if you're a professor and you get a best paper award, boy, your salary gets bumped up. Uh, as a graduate student, it's really incredible. He has won the IEEE SMC 2017 Best Student Paper Award. SMC's, SMC stands for the Society on, um, uh, the, the Society on I, for, I forgot what it's called. Systems Man in Cybernetics. Okay, thank you. Uh, Systems Man in Cybernetics. The IJCNN uh, 2017 INS Intel Best Student Paper Award. The IJCNN 2017 Best Poster Award. And IJCNN stands for the International Joint Conference on Neural Networks. And he also won the CIKM 2014 Best Paper Award. He is a former NSF GRFP fellow and Ford Foundational pre-doctoral fellow as, uh, a, a, and previously interned at Yahoo Labs and Microsoft Research. This summer, Dr. Montanez will be joining the computer science faculty at Harvey Mudd College in Claremont, California as an assistant professor. His academic website is whymachinelearningworks.com. So if you want to get into the nitty gritty, that's where to go, whymachinelearningworks.com. He is the proud father of three children, age six, four, and one fifty second. Oh, it's three fifty sevenths. Okay, three fifty seconds, meaning that he had a little daughter born three weeks ago. So, nevertheless, he's here with with him. Please uh, join me in welcoming to the podium George Montanez. Hi. So before I begin, I really want to um, just show my gratitude for being able to be here to honor Dr. Bradley. Uh, Bob didn't mention this specifically, but at my time at Baylor, uh, Dr. Bradley was also a big influence on me, which shouldn't surprise you. He was a big influence on everybody he came across. Um, and so for me, it's an honor to be able to honor him in this way. Uh, so tonight I'm going to be talking to you about a question that I've grappled with uh, for a long time which is, can we make machines in our image? Now, my chosen field of research is machine learning, which attempts to answer that question in the affirmative through the creation of specific systems to do just that. Over the past 40 years or so of machine learning research, uh, there have been a lot of progress uh, fields of progress made, and also some surprises in this research. And to my mind, one of the biggest surprises has been the need for bias in algorithms. And typically when we hear about bias in machine learning, we always hear about it in a negative context, right? We have these algorithms which are deciding whether people should be sent back to prison or whether someone should be given a loan, and we don't want these algorithms to be biased. But at a very fundamental level, bias is what actually powers machine learning. And it turns out that if you want an algorithm that is unbiased, so an algorithm that is capable of learning anything equally, everything equally well, you end up with an algorithm that can't actually learn. You end up with something that's called a rote memorizer. So if you show it something that you've already given it in training, it'll be able to regurgitate the exact answer uh, you presented it with, but if you show it something new, it actually can't decide, and it'll just randomly give you an answer. Um, and so this sort of bias uh, that we need to give to the algorithms, we give it in different ways. Typically, we give it through the choice of architecture, how we're going to set up these algorithms in the first place, and also how we're going to tune the algorithms through things called hyperparameters. So these are like tuning knobs on these algorithms. And these decisions need to be made before you actually look at your data. And so this presents us with a trade-off. Because inherently, if we are biasing our algorithms towards some specific end, we're simultaneously biasing it against other directions. 
right? So there's no such thing as a universal problem solver. Um, furthermore, we found that for any fixed algorithm, the proportion of problems for which it could actually do exceedingly well is exceedingly small. So the better you want it to do on one problem, the worse it's going to do on everything else. So I wanted to study machine learning systems because I wanted to learn how they worked. Uh, to me, they were like these magical black boxes and I wanted to look inside the box. And what I've learned through my, my years of study in this field is that they're not magical. They're not even that mysterious, right? What they are are highly optimized, finely tuned systems which leverage our own insight into how the world works through the biases that we impart. And this is the bias that allows these systems to actually generalize beyond their training data. So in a sentence, they're actually reflections of us, however crude. Uh, but this, to my mind, brings up a very important question, which is, if they are reflections of us, if they're approximations of us, how close of an approximation can we make? And Alan Turing, who was the uh, luminary father of computer science in many ways, he presented a question, which is, can machines think? And he felt that that question was very vague and very hard to answer. So he suggested, let's try a, a simpler question which is can we make machines which reliably fool human judges into thinking that the machine is a human? And so in other words, I can paraphrase this. Can we make approximations that are so close to ourselves that the fact that they are approximations no longer matters? And I think this is an important and um, kind of more concrete question, right? So in many ways, if you're trying to draw a circle, you'll never be able to draw a completely perfect circle. But you can get so close with a machine helping you, perhaps, that at some point it doesn't matter if you can get a completely perfect circle. It'll be close enough. And so will we get to the point where this distinction will cease to have the big importance that it has now? I feel that that's an open question. And again, my, my field of research is machine learning and we're working on these things. Um, to bring Alan Turing up again, the same year that he wrote his revolutionary paper introducing the Turing machine, which uh, forms the basis for a lot of modern computation theory, somebody else wrote an equivalent formulation, some guy, Emil Post. But Emil's machine was not like Alan Turing's because Emil's machine actually had a person who would mechanically do the motions. So he would update, or he or she would update the uh, symbols on a tape and move left or right. Alan Turing had the insight to realize that you could actually replace this person in the loop with just a finite state machine, which is a very simple machine. And I bring this up to say that even if machines can never fully replicate human beings, for a lot of things, we don't need all of human ability to be able to do them. For the Turing machine, you don't need the full panoply of human ability in order to have this machine work. You just need a finite state machine. And I think that we're kind of getting to that point in a lot of uh, the research in AI and machine learning to realize that maybe something like uh, being a travel agent, you could actually have a machine replace a person to do that because being a travel agent doesn't necessarily need the full range of human creativity and human experience. Um, and so that being said, this technology is already beginning to transform our society and it's going to continue to do so. And so I feel that the center is very important because the ways in which it's transforming our society, it's important to have people at the forefront who are looking at these issues from a responsible and a creative point of view rather than a pessimistic point of view. And so I am very happy um, that this work is going to be done and I want to continue in my own research to look at that question, how close can we make these approximations? But I want to do that in a way uh, that is looking at the question from an open point of view. What, not necessarily answering the question before I research it, but just looking for, we were, we're already approximating these things, how much further can we push this approximation and can we do it in a direction that's going to benefit humans rather than harm them? Um, and that's pretty much what I have for remarks. Thank you all for coming here. And let's give a round of applause again for Dr. Bradley. Thank you.